Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to lesson number two of computer applications. We are talking about the basic nuts and bolts of what makes a computer operate. Um, we started off with lesson one giving you the general overview of a computer, and today we're going to get a wee bit more specific as we go into the details of what's inside your computer. And today we're going to start off with what makes up the central processing unit, otherwise known as the CPU. First thing we have in the CPU is known as the control unit, and it is basically the policeman standing in the middle of the intersection directing the flow of traffic going on inside your computer. It directs the flow of the program data. So it basically tells the computer what to do. And the other function that takes place inside the central processing unit is the arithmetic logic unit, otherwise known as the ALU. This is where all the math and computing is done. And it's not called a computer for nothing. If you don't have an arithmetic logic unit, you don't have a computer. It makes calculations very, very, very fast. In fact, every time a new computer comes out or a new microchip comes out, the speed of the arithmetic logic unit increases. We also have something called memory. And this is a term we use very often when we talk about computers. How much memory do you have? And you might think of this in terms of your cell phone. Do you have 16 gigs? Do you have 64 gigs? Do you have 128 gigs? And more importantly, how much of that memory do you actually use? I know when I had a 16 gig phone, it filled up with pictures and music pretty fast. So when I upgraded to my iPhone 6 and got 64 gigs, I was pretty happy with that. So there are different kinds of memory. The first we call RAM, and that is not a football team from St. Louis slash Los Angeles. It stands for Random Access Memory. It means memory you access randomly. It is not essential for the computer to operate, um, but it can be accessed um, when needed. And Random Access Memory is electronic components that are temporarily store instructions waiting to be executed by the processor and data that's needed by those instructions and the results of that data. So it doesn't have to be there for the computer to operate, but it is there for a specific purpose or reason. And it consists of chips uh, on the memory module that fit into slots on the memory board. That's if it's inside the computer. Um, and basically you can add RAM into as many slots inside the computer as you would like. And maybe we'll look inside a computer so you can see what we're, we're talking about. Um, how do we measure memory? This is, these are terms that are thrown around a lot and sometimes the average person doesn't actually know what they mean. It, it is a bit mathematical in nature. Um, first thing is we have what's called a byte. So that's one letter or character such as the letter A. So any button you push on the keyboard that creates a, a character would be essentially requiring or creating a byte of information. Um, a kilobyte, kilo meaning 1,000, um, is equal to 1,024 bytes or 1,024 memory locations. You may ask yourself, Mr. B, if it means 1,000, why does it say 1,024? And my answer is, wait for it, I don't know. Um, a megabyte is approximately 1 million bytes. So it's 1,000, 1,000, a megabyte. So megabyte, now you're getting into a pretty reasonably large amount of memory. A gigabyte, and keep in mind, you know, we're talking about your phone being 16 gigs, 32 gigs, 64 gigs, 128 gigs. A gigabyte is approximately 1 billion bytes. That's a lot of bytes. And then when you get into terabytes, you're talking about trillions. So we're talking your, your biggest supercomputers in the world are operating uh, in the realm of terabytes. And the average 
home computer is not going to come anywhere near a terabyte. Oops, let's go back to that. One gigabyte is approximately 500,000 letter size pages of text information. So, and to think that you need 128 of those to have a phone that goes in your pocket, that's a little bit strange, folks. We've gotten used to that and we've come to accept that as normal in our world today. Um, maybe you think I'm old, but uh, 10 years ago, that wouldn't have been on our minds. So, let's talk about this a little bit. What can store information? And you'll see two examples at the bottom, your handy dandy flash drive, which is becoming irrelevant because of things like Google Drive and Dropbox. Um, in the old days, we had disks. We call them old school, Escuela Vieja. They were floppy. I remember when they were three and a quarter inches. I remember when they were almost four inches. Um, they were big, uh, but we thought they were cool because you could put them in the sleeve of your, your binder and that made you cool. Uh, then they got smaller and then they shrank and then we got to CDs which can hold a lot of information uh, and DVDs which can actually hold a lot more information. Up until a few years ago I was always burning a DVD of all my teaching materials that are on, uh, on the computer at the end of the school year but now I don't really need to do that because of Google Drive. We also have flash drives. This is an example of a flash drive down here. They've gotten smaller than that and they've gotten to the point where they can hold more than four gigabytes of information. Uh, please ignore the earthquake in the background. It's the first day of school and uh, Mr. Conwell's sub has kids there. Um, we also have the cloud. So Google Drive would be an example of the cloud and Dropbox would be an example of the cloud. You are literally storing your information not on your computer, not on a flash drive that you can hold in your hands. You are storing it remotely. You're storing it on servers that exist wherever Google decides to put its servers or wherever Dropbox decides to put its servers. Um, if you're on Facebook or Instagram, all of that information is stored on their servers you are basically giving permission to those organizations to hold and store your information if you put it there. So, um, it's convenient. You don't have to have physical hardware, but you give up control and ownership to some degree when you use those devices. Now, with Google Drive and Dropbox, you can erase stuff if you want. When you put stuff on Facebook, uh, you can. it's pretty much theirs forever if they want to keep it. That's something to think about. So let's talk about the way computers talk to each other. How do computers communicate? First of all, all computers have hardware that enable them to send, otherwise known as transmit, and receive data. Sending and transmitting data is what computers do. Uh, that includes instructions and it includes information um, that one or more computers might need. Uh, if your computer is not networked, if your computer is not set up to talk to other computers, um, it is very limited in what it's going to be able to do for you. For instance, if your computer is not networked, you are not going to get on the internet because the net in internet stands for network and the inter stands between. So the internet is between networks. Um, there are devices that help your computer to communicate, that help it to transmit. Uh, back in the day, as they say, we had telephone or cable modems. Um, they made this whooshing sound. Um, it's, you would sign on to America Online somewhere around 1995, and after you got the whooshing sound that was like whoosh, 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 the whooshing sound would end, and all of a sudden you would hear, you've got mail. And that was a very exciting moment. Um, and those used basic telephone lines. And then we graduated up to cable. So if you get your internet through Comcast, you're getting it much, much faster. Um, and you can now get it over cell phone networks. So now the internet is flying through the air. And that's where Wi-Fi comes from. And if you have a, a device that's enabled to access wireless networks like Verizon or AT&T, 
uh, or Sprint, then you are basically online unless you're out in the boonies where there's no cell phone coverage. So uh, obviously wires, wireless means without wires, um, and all of Waldo these days uh, has wireless access points all throughout the building. So uh, as long as your phone is properly logged in, you're pretty much logged on, but also anything you do can and will be seen by the Salem-Kaiser School District. So be careful what you do. And that's where we're going to stop it for today. Uh, lesson three will finish up the basics of computers. Uh, if you want to go ahead and write yourself a summary so you can memor memorize some of this, that's great. Uh, there will be a test, so I highly recommend you do something to retain this information. This is Mr. Blumenthal signing off. Yet another lesson here in computer literacy class. Have a great day.